Our next speaker is Joseph Boardman, the president and CEO of Amtrak, and we would like to invite you up. He is, was appointed president chief executive officer of Amtrak by the board of directors in 2008. As president and CEO, he oversees the management of America's Railroad, which carried 30.2 million passengers in 2011, which is an all-time record for Amtrak. And we have something for you. We are presenting you with an award today. I know this is a surprise. This is called the Heroes of High Speed Rail. And we're presenting this to you for, in recognition of your efforts delivering high speed rail to America. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And what Joe Borman has done is a double job. It's the tough job of actually running Amtrak that never has enough money and is always under scrutiny from Congress and everybody else. And at the same time, advancing high-speed rail in the middle of all that. So that's actually a double amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. I probably got the wrong speech here then after that. <laughs> uh, thank you. I really am glad to be here this morning. Still morning. Uh, and I have been back and forth about whether I should do a uh, PowerPoint or a video or just talk to you. And when I looked around, what I saw was that you had Stephen Gardner here. You really didn't need me here because Stephen brings the kind of passion and understanding and delivery of what we're going to do for high-speed rail division, I think, in a very effective and, and uh, positive way. And yet I thought, all right, so the CEO, what should he really be talking about? What should I be talking about here this morning? And it really, it was uh, something I began to think about after I heard the real reason that we have to make sure that we retain the alignment for high-speed rail independent station. And it was about preservation. It was about that we're not ready to build the line. But if we don't have preservation of the ability to build that line, then how many generations will lose what we need for the future of uh, rail in this country? I'll be 65 this year. And uh, when I look around the room, I see a few others that are probably in about the same category. And it, it does make you start thinking about things a little bit differently than you have in the past. Uh, I'm on the forefront of the baby boomers. I lost my father this year, the greatest generation, or just the end of last year, and my older brother who was really on the forefront of uh, the baby boomers. So why am I doing what I'm doing? Why are we trying to do uh, what we're trying to do here to improve rail in America? My start in this, my path to this job, began as a bus driver in college. It was after I got out of the military. I, went, I was a Vietnam volunteer back in 1966. And, uh, and during the time I was in college, we had a gas crisis at the same time, if you remember that in the 70s, and some of you, in fact, do. And so transit and transportation and moving people was something I thought was particularly important because of that energy problem uh, that began way back then. The environmental part came along a little bit later. It came along when I was with the State Transportation Department in uh, New York, the Commissioner of Transportation. And it came along because of Bobby Kennedy Jr., I guess, more than anybody, but also uh, George Pataki, who was an environmentalist governor. And one of the questions he asked uh, me early on, and I started as the Assistant Commissioner for Public Transportation in 95, and I was the commissioner by 97. He said, what can we do about all the trucks that are on the throughway on Route 90 that are moving across the country? And my answer at the time was invest and create, which is a Chicago project. Most of you and any of you that are in rail know what that is. Because it takes as long to get through Chicago for railroads as it does to get across the country from the West Coast to Chicago. And so it was important to do that. Well, you know how that went over? We didn't make an investment in CREATE. But he at least, I think, understood it. It isn't just about the investment within the state that you're in 
or the community. It's about the larger elements of what we need to do in this country. I wasn't naive when I said to him that we needed to invest in uh, and create. I wanted to tell him the real problem, the truth about what has to happen. And that's to make decisions that are not necessarily in your backyard. They're across the nation. They're changes that we need to make. Understand, please, and I think you do, that Amtrak's not about the price of hamburgers. Nor is Amtrak exclusively about high-speed rail. It's about connecting scattered families. And that comes from the post office, and there's a lot of similarity between the post office and Amtrak in many ways. It's about operating border to border and coast to coast to connect those families and to connect the railroads. It's about preservation of critical links in this country. If you had a map, and I thought about bringing it up here, and you began to really start taking the rail pieces out of the map, and let me tell you what would happen first. The Southwest Chief would go first. And everybody would look at me and say, why is that? And I heard somebody groan over here. It's the highest cost. It's not that we lose the most per passenger. It costs us the most to operate the Southwest Chief. And then the Sunset Limited, which everybody likes to beat us up with. And then the Zephyr. And then the Empire Builder. What's left to connect the East with the West? Nothing. Where do you draw the line? Where will Congress draw the line in support? The freight railroads have kept their bargain. They would charge us a whole lot more if they could for being out on their railroads. And we see that when we wanted to expand the Sunset Limited to seven days instead of three days a week, there was an expectation because of the opportunity cost that we would present to them for not being able to move their railroad, they expected to be able to charge in the neighborhood of $700 million. Amtrak was not in a position to, to execute $700 million or $100 million or $200 million. There wasn't any negotiation for something like that. It wasn't going to happen. The third thing that we're about is meeting customer wants, needs, and expectations, whether that's on the Northeast Corridor or elsewhere. It's really about the capacity, which the Union Pacific really talked about for the Sunset Limited. It's about the reliability, and we can talk about Sandy for a minute, the Storm Sandy. Sandy cut. New England and New York City off from the rest of the nation. Just like the Port of New Jersey cuts off New England and New York from the rest of the nation. Because in fact, the Hudson River is still a barrier today like it was 300 years ago or more. And is it more important to have rail connections and build new rail connections to New York than it is to build the Tappan Zee Bridge? for those that know the territory? My answer is yes, because you can go down to Palisades and go across to George Washington. If the tunnels are closed, and they were, they were flooded, where do you go? There is nowhere to go. The Poughkeepsie Bridge is now a walkway bridge. You can go all the way up to Albany, I guess, to Selkirk, turn the trains around and kind of go across uh, up there. Practically speaking, there is no way into the city if the tunnels are flooded. You learned something else about Amtrak when the tunnels got flooded. Are we public or are we private? Every private corporation has uh, presidential appointees for board of directors and Senate confirmation, right? Of course not. 
does a public agency receive assistance from the Corps of Engineers in a flood? Not Amtrak. When we asked and reached out because we wanted to pump out the tunnels in New York City, we were told we were a private company. We'd have to prove that those tunnels were publicly owned. Even though out of the 500 trains that go through there every day, 400 of them or 380 are New Jersey Transit and 100 of them are Amtrak. We didn't have time to argue about that, so we pumped the tunnel ourselves, and we returned service by the following night, and we're glad that the tunnels weren't ruptured. But think about what really happens. We don't do that very well. We don't think about our risk very well in this nation, about what's going to happen to us as we keep getting more efficient, but with less redundancy, with less ability to deliver what we need to deliver for the future, with less ability to get a reasonable price for energy, and then an inability to really find a more efficient way to provide the use of that energy for the future. So Congress is supposed to pay for those long distance trains. And they do, sort of. And they've been taking credit for reducing costs, just like we have for the long distance trains. But how's that happened? It's because the revenue has been up on the Northeast Corridor. And almost 300 million now of revenue on the Northeast Corridor goes into subsidizing the long distance trains to connect the nation. Is that important? Yes. Should it be done that way? I don't think so. I think we need to really be looking at what we use those revenues for and they should be invested more in the capital of what we need along the corridor, including new train sets, including other. I thought one of the best reports I'd read in a long time, and I haven't entirely finished it, was what our staff, and maybe you heard a little bit about this uh, during this conference, and what the Northeast Corridor Commission put together to, to, to make it understand, understandable for the projects that need to be done, the $52, $54 billion worth of projects just for state of good repair and to maintain the capacity we have today. It's a good report. The thing that sticks out the most to me, and John, I told you this yesterday, I think, most of what is in here is that feasibility studies are done. No preliminary engineering, nothing much beyond that. It's all there with an estimate of what it would cost, but not the kind of thing that we need. As a commissioner of state transportation commissioner, you have several years worth of money that you expect coming down the pike. Now that's changing for all those transportation commissioners for highways. Highway is, and the mode has really begun to change. And the same thing happens with uh, aviation. 50,000 of the 60,000 employees at uh, USDOT are FAA employees. So there's a definite investment in what aviation has as support in this nation. But what we need to do is we need to get a state of good repair even to get at the high speed that we all want and we all talk about. So preservation and progress, connectivity, long distance train, state corridors, commuter rail, high speed rail, and the transit systems that operate. You need them all. And we need to find a way to keep them connected. Because people don't want to come to Washington if they can't get out of Washington and around in the community. Many of them take cabs, but the more knowledgeable ones use the metro system or use the circulator bus or they use something different or some of them may even be able to use the bicycles that we have around the, the, uh, the capital region. For those of you that are around here, you know the red bicycles that ought to be on the roads and around the sidewalks when you're walking. Chicago's Create and Gateway Project, the West Coast Ports Alameda Corridor, the Transcon routes that the major freight railroads are putting together, the New Orleans Gateway, the Memphis Gateway, 
The ports along the East Coast all need access and they need preservation of those rail connections. Absolutely, no question. But another gateway needs preservation and needs to be taken care of. And that's the Amtrak New Jersey Transit Gateway. When I was in New York, we used to call it ARC, access to the region's core. The decision was made to go run it into New York City and we were told continually that, well, we couldn't get it into Penn Station, we had to go somewhere else, which was a negative. I dragged my feet as the Federal Railroad Administrator to approve that uh, EIS to make that happen, because I didn't believe it. But it got pushed through and delivered. Oh no, it didn't get delivered, did it? It stopped and got pulled back, and that was an opportunity for Amtrak and for those that began to understand that connectivity issue. How do you get this done? You need to get into Penn Station. Sandy's demonstrated the lack of ability for us, but what is more important, create, which hasn't been done and fixed and done the way we need it to get done, also demonstrates that it's more important to deliver an alignment and preserve that ability for the alignment into New York than it is to do anything else right now for the future. It's a $120 million project of preservation that maintains the alignment into Penn Station because this economy is in fact improving and the related real estate industry or related uh, companies prove that by the fact that they've advanced their project much quicker, and Stephen must, might have talked about this the other day, they've advanced it so quickly that if they put their base uh, 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 course into where they're gonna build over the west side yards, and we don't have a preservation of that alignment, we will not be able to have that for the future, and we're on a pretty short timetable for that to happen. We see that as a critical element in whatever we do for the future of high speed or any speed rail into New York to improve the economy. We handle 1,000 trains a day in Penn Station. We need to be able to handle 2,000 trains a day. That's where we're headed. The demographics are there. 40 million people 40 miles along the corridor today, 60 million in just the next 20 years. Young people are moving to the urban centers. Us baby boomers are getting older and maybe we're moving somewhere else, but we're using trains more often than we have in the past. Our ridership is up. We've maintained and, and built an increasing record of ridership and of nine of the last 10 years. Our revenues are up. We can see that happening. But the ride quality on the corridor, in my opinion, is beginning to degrade because we need to make investments again in that state of good repair. You have to fix what you build, and the highway industry is seeing that today, along with others. We are a country that needs to make investment in our infrastructure. We hear it, but we don't believe it. We don't know how to act. We don't know how to get it forward. Well, Congress needs to act. So do locals, and Rod, I heard, heard you say it. The locals need to understand what they're going to lose. They need to preserve, not use it up. Deliver something new for the future. We have to preserve this alignment. We must preserve this alignment for future generations. These tunnels are over 100 years old now. The Baltimore and Potomac tunnels are quite a bit older than that, right after the Civil War. Investments have been made by private industry in many cases. But high-speed rail investments need, and those who have listened to what the private industry is telling Congress, is they need two things. First, Congress needs to understand that the private sector is willing to put in 10, 15%, maybe a little bit more in the investments of the kinds of things that we're talking about. That's about it. Perry Offit kept saying that in one of the hearings I was at last year. That's where they are. What's that money gonna cost? It depends on the risk that's being established. If we have one year funding cycles, the risk is high. We know that. 
The risk would have been high and probably never delivered the interstate highway system on one-year funding cycles. We need more than that. We need five years or more to plan and deliver the kinds of projects that need to be done. We all know it. How do we get there? Only through Congress and the administration. But Congress has got to stop dithering. They've got to start delivering what we need in this country for infrastructure. Water systems, sewer systems, highways, buildings, aviation systems, and rail and transit. Thanks for being here. Hey, Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, Mr. Boardman, you, you mentioned that uh, $300 million worth of uh, Northeast, you mentioned that $300 million worth of Northeast Corridor uh, revenues are used to uh, underwrite uh, operations for the rest of the system. And understanding the need for, uh, in critical need for investments in the Northeast Corridor, uh, what would happen, though, to our ability to connect families on the rest of the system without that $300 million? Congress would need to do what they were supposed to do. Yes, sir. Uh, keeping things local here in Washington, um, what's your opinion on the Burnham Place development over Union Station, and what sort of impact do you think that can have here, and do you think we can see other developments like that throughout the country? I think the reality of it is that you need to find the financing for it, and the private sector is already in for that. They want to be part of that. Uh, but they also, it's a, uh, how did I say it the other night? It wasn't a chicken and egg question. It's kind of like whether you had the scrambled eggs or whether you had any eggs whatsoever, is you've got to move all of these things forward as you can. And Burnham Place, as a vision for the future, I think is critical, whether it's Burnham Place, or whether it's Moynihan Station, which is another vision for New York City, and we're working on one for Philadelphia, and Baltimore is beaten the snot out of us to make sure that we build one for Baltimore and for Boston and for all of those that want something to happen. Uh, they look for that. So I think it's all there, and it's going to happen. And I think Rod was up here and telling you it's going to happen. When's it going to happen? When people, you people, but the people behind you, the people that are coming behind me, my kids and my grandkids now, begin to understand that this generation, this baby boomer generation, is failing us if we don't deliver this for the future. We're the ones here now. Let's deliver it. Right. Joe, you know, the. Um uh, I think it's it's clear that the faster you're able to maintain an average speed between cities up to about four or five hundred miles, the more market you're going to recover, and the more profitable it will be. Your your uh, Acela line is doing wonderfully now, and it's subsidizing the rest of the Amtrak system. Well, as the high-speed rail system uh, goes into development in the nation, uh, it would it would it could be that they'll be operated by foreign operators. That would be a, tra that would be a tragedy because high-speed rail, as you can see with Acela, is going to be very profitable. And it could subsidize the rest of your uh, slower speed system. Are you able to communicate with organizations like uh, the California High-Speed Rail Authority and the North Northwest Corridor and the others in a manner that would put you in a position to uh, to be a dominant force in that bidding process to be the operator? Uh, we'd like to think so, Rod. I think uh, Amtrak uh, has its advantages and its baggage, and I see that more now. I'm, I'm probably now the third longest uh, CEO for, for Amtrak, which is amazing in and of itself because I'm not quite to five years yet. And so part of the difficulty for Amtrak is this constant changing of leadership. Um, what we need to do, and we are doing it, is improving from within 
with a strategic plan, with balanced scorecards, with goals, the kinds of things that with total reward system for employees, with new training systems, things that we're beginning to roll out that we're delivering uh, for our own employees and for the nation, a better service. And the better we get, the more competitive we're going to be for the future. And I think our folks are understanding that. And I know some of our folks are in the room today to try to understand that. And some of our our craft people see that as the future and they're trying to figure out for themselves is what's this all about and what does it mean to us? It means that we need to be good at what we do. It needs, we, means we need to still be competitive on what we pay because this industry is based on a large part on the freight industry who's doing well, has done the well, best in the world and they're delivering the same kind of, of uh, craft work. So we're we believe that we can be competitive with that standard. The reason McDonald's can sell hamburgers a lot cheaper than us is it got a lot to do with what McDonald's competition is in regard to doing that. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned freight rail and much of the track that Amtrak uses is shared with freight railroads. What kind of understandings you have with them in maintaining the state of good repair, um, priority access, and how has the access system, which is on a cellar, helped ensure safety on the Northeast Corridor? Uh, great question. Uh, Freight rail, because they're the ones who operated the, the uh, passenger rail system back before 1971 when Amtrak began, um, had a, a, a great desire to get rid of passenger services. And as a part of that uh, agreement way back at that point in time, uh, Amtrak was granted some substantial rights of access and uh, has been negotiating operating agreements differently for each uh, major railroad over the last 42 years, it'll be 42 years in May, um, but it has a good, strong relationship with the freight railroads. Uh, the freight railroads, of course, would like us to, to know that, uh, or to operate at 79 miles an hour, which is where they believe is their sweet spot in delivering freight across the country. And quite frankly, with a reliable, on-time performance 79 mile an hour service, we do pretty well with the long distance trains. Uh, part of the problem, though, is there are many that want to go faster. We don't call it high speed. We call it a little bit faster, right, Andy or, or, or Rod? We, uh, we're looking at how we can improve that. We looked at it, certainly, and I think you had uh, the uh, secretary and uh, the administrator here a little while ago, and he probably talked about 110 miles an hour between uh, St. Louis and Chicago. We're doing that now up in Michigan. So we're, we're able to go faster. Part of the, the freight need, though, and I'm trying to understand from the freights, is what do they need now for the future? They're bought into every the same kind of, of uh, business management that everybody sort of gets bought into today, Lean Six Sigma and the effort to really reduce our costs and improve how we deliver services and not have any more assets than we need to deliver what we need. But they've bought into and understand and have been supportive of passenger railroads to deliver what they promised from 42 years ago. Oh, they'd like a little more money and they don't want us to expand and they don't want us to go any faster and those kinds of things. But they're there. They've been with us. They're trying to figure out how they can squeeze a little more money out of us. But everybody does that today in one fashion, form, or another. Acela has been a, uh, a major contributor for us on the Northeast Corridor, not only in revenue, but also in being able to figure out how to run high speed safely. And I think that's part of what you're talking about too, uh, Rod, over here is Amtrak knows how to do that. So what did high speed in California do? They came and got Amtrak's chief engineer, which we know Frank Vaca well and have great respect for him and what he's been able to do with his geometry cars and understanding how to run high speed safely. Thank you very much.